After some time, the hobbits heard him murmuring again. He seemed to be counting on his fingers. Fangorn. Fingless. Fladriff. Fie. Fie. He sighed. The trouble is that there are so few of us left he said, turning towards the hobbits. Only three remain of the first Ents that walked in the woods before the darkness. Only myself, Fangorn, and Finglas, and Fladrith, to give them their elvish names. You may call them Leaflock and Skinbark, if you like that better. And of us three, Leaflock and Skinbark are not much use for this business. Leaflock has grown sleepy, almost tree-ish, you might say. He has taken to standing by himself half asleep all through the summer with the deep grass of the meadows round his knees, covered with leafy hair he is. He used to rouse up in winter, but of late he has been too drowsy to walk far even then. Skinbark lived on the mountain slopes west of Isengard. That is where the worst trouble has been. He was wounded by the orc and many of his folk and his tree herds have been murdered and destroyed. He has gone up into the high places among the birches that he loves best and he will not come down. Still, I dare say I could get together a fair company of our younger folks, if I could make them understand the need, if I could rouse them. We are not a hasty folk. What a pity there are so few of us. "'Why are there so few when you have lived in this country so long?' asked Pippin. "'Have a great many died?' "'Oh, no,' said Treebeard. "'None have died from inside, as you might say. "'Some have fallen in the evil chances of the long years, of course, "'and more have grown tree-ish. But there were never many of us, and we have not increased. There have been no endings, no children, you would say, not for a terrible long count of years. You see, we lost the Entwives. How very sad, said Pippin. How was it that they all died? They did not die, said Treebeard. I never said died. We lost them, I said. We lost them, and we cannot find them. He sighed. I thought most folk knew that. There were songs about the hunt of the Ents, for the Entwives sung among elves and men from Mirkwood to Gondor. They cannot be quite forgotten. Well, I'm afraid the songs have not come west over the mountains to the Shire, said Mary. Won't you tell us some more?
or sing us one of the songs? Yes, I will, indeed, said Treebeard, seeming pleased with the request. But I cannot tell it properly, only in short, and then we must end our talk. Tomorrow we have councils to call and work to do and maybe a journey to begin. It is rather a strange and sad story, he went on after a pause, when the world was young and the woods were wide and wild, the Ents and the Entwives, and there were Ent Maidens then. Ah, the loveliness of Fimbrethil, of one limb the light-footed. In the days of our youth, they walked together, and they housed together, but... Our hearts did not go on growing in the same way. The Ents gave their love to things that they met in the world, and the Ent wives gave their thought to other things. For the Ents loved the great trees, and the wild woods, and the slopes of the high hills, and they drank of the mountain streams, and ate only such fruit as the trees let fall in their path. And they learned of the elves, and spoke with the trees. But the ant wives gave their minds to the lesser trees and to the meads in the sunshine beyond the feet of the forests, and they saw the slow in the thicket, and the wild apple and the cherry blossoming in spring, and the green herbs in the waterlands in summer, and the seeding grasses in the autumn fields. They did not desire to speak with these things, but they wished them to hear and obey what was said to them. The Ent wives ordered them to grow according to their wishes and bear leaf and fruit to their liking, for the Ent wives desired order and plenty and peace by which they meant that things should remain where they had set them. So the Entwives made gardens to live in. But we Ents went on wandering, and we only came to the gardens now and again. Then, when the darkness came in the north, the Entwives crossed the great river, and made new gardens and tilled new fields, and we saw them more seldom. After the darkness was overthrown, the land of the Entwives blossomed richly, and their fields were full of corn. Many men learned the crafts of the Entwives and honoured them greatly. But we were only a legend to them, a secret in the heart of the forest. Yet here we still are, while all the gardens of the Entwives are wasted. Men call them the Brown Lands now. I remember it was long ago, in the time of the war between Sauron and the men of the sea, desire came over me to see Fimbrethil again. Very fair she was still in my eyes when I had last seen her, though little like the Ent Maiden of old. 
for the entwives were bent and browned by their labour, their hair parched by the sun to the hue of ripe corn, and their cheeks like red apples. Yet their eyes were still the eyes of our own people. We crossed over Anduin and came to their land. But we found a desert. It was all burned and uprooted, for war had passed over it. But the Entwives were not there. Long we called and long we searched, and we asked all folk that we met which way the Entwives had gone. Some said they had never seen them, and some said that they had seen them walking away west, and some said east, and others south. But nowhere that we went could we find them. Our sorrow was very great. Yet the wild wood called, and we returned to it. For many years we used to go out every now and again and look for the Entwives walking far and wide and calling them by their beautiful names. But as time passed we went more seldom and wandered less far. And now the Entwives are only a memory for us, and our beards are long and grey. The elves made many songs concerning the search of the Ents, and some of the songs passed into the tongues of men, but we made no songs about it, being content to chant their beautiful names when we thought of the Entwives. We believe that we may meet again in a time to come, and perhaps we shall find somewhere a land where we can live together and both be content. But it is foreboded that that will only be when we have both lost all that we now have, and it may well be that that time is drawing near at last. For if Sauron of old destroyed the gardens, the enemy today seems likely to wither all the woods. There was an elvish song that spoke of this, or at least so I understand it. It used to be sung up and down the great river. It was never an Entish song, mark you. It would have been a very long song in Entish. But we know it by heart and hum it now and again. This is how it runs in your tongue. End. When spring unfolds the beech and leaf and sap is in the bough, when light is on the wildwood stream and wind is on the brow, when stride is long and breath is deep and keen the mountain air, come back to me, come back to me, and say my land is fair. Entwife, 
when spring is come to goth and field and corn is in the blade, when blossom like a shining snow is on the orchard laid, when shower and sun upon the earth with fragrance fill the air, I'll linger here and will not come because my land is fair. End. When summer lies upon the world and in a noon of gold beneath the roof of sleeping leaves the dreams of trees unfold. When woodland halls are green and cool and wind is in the west, Come back to me, come back to me, and say my land is best. End wife. When summer warms the hanging fruit and burns the berry brown, when straw is gold and ear is white and harvest comes to town, when honey spills and apples swells the wind be in the west i'll linger here beneath the sun because my land is best End. When winter comes, the winter wild that hill and wood shall slay when tree shall fall and starless night devour the sunless day when wind is in the deadly east then in the bitter rain I'll look for thee and call to thee. I'll come to thee again. End wife. When winter comes and singing ends, when darkness falls at last, when broken is the barren bow and light and labor past, I'll look for thee and wait for thee until we meet again. Together we will take the road beneath the bitter rain. Both. Together we will take the road that leads into the west, and far away we'll find a land where both our hearts may rest. Treebeard ended his song. That is how it goes, he said. It is elvish, of course, light-hearted, quick-worded, and soon over, I dare say it is fair enough. But the Ents could say more on their side if they had time. But now I am going to stand up and take a little sleep. Where will you stand? We usually lie down to sleep, said Mary. We shall be all right where we are. Lie down to sleep, said Treebeard. Why, of course you do. I was forgetting. <laughs> Singing that song put me in mind of old times, 
almost thought that I was talking to young endings, I did. Well, you can lie on the bed. I am going to stand in the rain. Good night. Merry and Pippin climbed onto the bed and curled up in the soft grass and fern. It was fresh and sweet-scented and warm. The lights died down and the glow of the trees faded, but outside, under the arch, they could see old Treebeard standing motionless with his arms raised above his head. The bright stars peered out of the sky and lit the falling water as it spilled onto his fingers and head and dripped, dripped, in hundreds of silver drops onto his feet. Listening to the tinkling of the drops, the hobbits fell asleep. They woke to find a cool sun shining into the great court and onto the floor of the bay. Shreds of high cloud were overhead, running on a stiff easterly wind. Treebeard was not to be seen, but while Merry and Pippin were bathing in the basin by the arch, they heard him humming and singing as he came up the path between the trees. Ooh. Oh, good morning, Merry and Pippin, he boomed when he saw them. You sleep long. I have been many a hundred strides already today. Now we will have a drink and go to Entmoo. He poured them out two full bowls from a stone jar, but from a different jar. The taste was not the same as it had been the night before. It was earthier and richer, more sustaining and food-like, so to speak. While the hobbits drank, sitting on the edge of the bed and nibbling small pieces of elf cake, more because they felt that eating was a necessary part of breakfast than because they felt hungry, Treebeard stood humming in Entish or Elvish or some strange tongue and looking up at the sky. Where is Entmoot? Pippin ventured to ask. Who? Eh? Entmoot? said Treebeard, turning round. It is not a place. It is a gathering of Ents, which does not often happen nowadays. But I have managed to make a fair number promise to come. We shall meet in the place where we have always met. Durndingle, men call it. It is away south from here. We must be there before noon. Before long they set off. Treebeard carried the hobbits in his arms as on the previous day. At the entrance to the court he turned to the right, stepped over the stream and strode away southwards along the feet of great tumbled slopes where trees were scanty. Above these the hobbits saw thickets of birch and rowan, and beyond them dark climbing pine woods. Soon Treebeard turned a little away from the hills and plunged into deep groves, where the trees were larger, taller and thicker than any that the hobbits had ever seen before. For a while they felt faintly the sense of stifling, which they had noticed when they first ventured into Fangorn, but it soon passed. Treebeard did not talk to them. He hummed to himself, deeply and thoughtfully. But Merry and Pippin caught no proper words. It sounded like boom, boom, rum, boom, boora, boom, boom, da, ra, boom, boom, da, ra, boom, and so on with a constant change of note and rhythm. Now and again they thought they heard an answer, a hum or a quiver of sound that seemed to 
come out of the earth, or from boughs above their heads, or, perhaps, from the boles of the trees. But Treebeard did not stop or turn his head to either side. They had been going for a long while. Pippin had tried to keep count of the Ent strides, but had failed, getting lost at about 3,000, when Treebeard began to slacken his pace. Suddenly he stopped, put the hobbits down, and raised his curled hands to his mouth, so that they made a hollow tube. Then he blew, or called, through them. A great... rang out like a deep-throated horn in the woods, and seemed to echo from the trees. Far off, there came from several directions a similar That was not an echo, but an answer. Treebeard, now perched, Merry and Pippin on his shoulders, and strode on again, every now and then sending out another horn call, and each time the answers came louder and nearer. In this way they came at last to what looked like an impenetrable wall of dark evergreen trees, trees of a kind that the hobbits had never seen before. They branched out right from the roots and were densely clad in dark, glossy leaves like thornless holly, and they bore many stiff, upright flower spikes with large, shining, olive-coloured buds. Turning to the left and skirting this huge hedge, Treebeard came in a few strides to a narrow entrance. Through it, a worn path passed and dived suddenly down a long, steep slope. The hobbits saw that they were descending into a great dingle, almost as round as a bowl, very wide and deep, crowned at the rim with the high, dark, evergreen hedge. It was smooth and grass-clad inside, and there were no trees except three very tall and beautiful silver birches that stood at the bottom of the bowl. Two other paths led down into the dingle from the west and from the east. Several Ents had already arrived. More were coming in down the other paths, and some were now following Treebeard. As they drew near, the hobbits gazed at them. They had expected to see a number of creatures, as much like Treebeard as one hobbit is like another, at any rate to a stranger's eye. And they were very much surprised to see nothing of the kind. The Ents were as different from one another as trees from trees, some as different as one tree is from another of the same name but quite different growth and history, and some as different as one tree kind from another, as birch from beech, oak from fir. There were a few older Ents, bearded and gnarled like hail but ancient trees, though none looked as ancient as Treebeard and there were tall, strong Ents, clean-limbed and smooth-skinned like forest trees in their prime. But there were no young Ents, no saplings. Altogether there were about two dozen, standing on the wide, grassy floor of the dingle, and as many more were marching in. At first, Merry and Pippin were struck chiefly by the variety that they saw, the many shapes and colours, the differences in girth and height and length of leg and arm, and in the number of toes and fingers, anything from three to nine. A few seemed more or less related to Treebeard and reminded them of beech trees or oaks, but there were other kinds. Some recalled the chestnut, brown-skinned Ents with large, splay-fingered hands and short, thick legs. Some recalled the ash, tall, straight, grey Ents with many-fingered hands and long legs. Some the fir, the tallest Ents, and others the birch, the rowan, and the linden. But when the Ents all gathered round Treebeard, bowing their heads slightly, murmuring in their slow, musical voices, and looking long and intently at the strangers, then the hobbits saw 
that they were all of the same kindred, and all had the same eyes. Not all so old or so deep as Treebeards, but all with the same slow, steady, thoughtful expression, and the same green flicker. As soon as the whole company was assembled, standing in a wide circle round Treebeard, a curious and unintelligible conversation began. The Ents began to murmur slowly, first one joined and then another, until they were all chanting together in a long, rising and falling rhythm, now louder on one side of the ring, now dying away there and rising to a great boom on the other side. Though he could not catch or understand any of the words, he supposed the language was Entish. Pippin found the sound very pleasant to listen to at first, but gradually his attention wavered. After a long time, and the chant showed no signs of slackening, he found himself wondering, since Entish was such an unhasty language, whether they had yet got further than good morning. And if Treebeard was to call the roll, how many days it would take to sing all their names. I wonder what the Entish is for yes or no, he thought. He yawned. Treebeard was immediately aware of him. Mm. Ah, hey, my Pippin, he said, and the other Ents all stopped their chant. You are a hasty folk, I was forgetting, and anyway it is wearisome listening to a speech you do not understand. You may get down now. I have told your names to the Entmoot, and they have seen you, and they have agreed that you are not orcs, and that a new line shall be put in the old lists. We have got no further yet, but that is quick work for an Entmoot. You and Mary can stroll about in the dingle if you like. There is a well of good water, if you need refreshing, away yonder in the north bank. There are still some words to speak before the moot really begins. I will come and see you again and tell you how things are going. He put the hobbits down. Before they walked away, they bowed low. This feat seemed to amuse the Ents very much, to judge by the tone of their murmurs and the flicker of their eyes, but they soon turned back to their own business. Merry and Pippin climbed up the path that came in from the west and looked through the opening in the great hedge. Long, tree-clad slopes rose from the lip of the dingle, and away beyond them, above the fir trees of the furthest ridge, there rose, sharp and white, the peak of a high mountain. Southwards to their left, they could see the forest falling away down into the grey distance. There, far away, there was a pale green glimmer that Merry guessed to be a glimpse of the plains of Rohan. I wonder where Isengard is, said Pippin. I don't know quite where we are, said Mary, but that peak is probably Methedras, and as far as I can remember, the ring of Isengard lies in a fork or deep cleft at the end of the mountains. It's probably down behind this great ridge, there seems to be a smoke or haze over there left of the peak, don't you think? What is Isengard like? said Pippin. I wonder what ants can do about it anyway. So do I, said Mary. Isengard is a sort of ring of rocks or hills, I think, with a flat space inside and an island or pillar of rock in the middle called Orthanc. Saruman has a tower on it. There is a gate, perhaps more than one, in the encircling wall, and I believe there is a stream running through it, and it comes out of the mountains and flows on across the gap of Rohan. It does not seem the sort of place for Ents to tackle. But I have an odd feeling about these Ents. Somehow, I don't think they're 
quite as safe and, well, funny as they seem. They seem slow, queer, impatient, almost sad. And yet, I believe they could be roused. If that happened, I would rather not be on the other side. Yes, said Pippin, I know what you mean. There might be all the difference between an old cow sitting and thoughtfully chewing and a bull charging, and the change might come suddenly. I wonder if Tree Beard will rouse them. I'm sure he means to try, but they don't like being roused. Treebeard got roused himself last night and then bottled it up again. The hobbits turned back. The voices of the Ents were still rising and falling in their conclave. The sun had now risen high enough to look over the high hedge. It gleamed on the tops of the birches and lit the northward side of the dingle with a cool yellow light. There they saw a little glittering fountain. They walked along the rim of the great bowl at the feet of the evergreens. It was pleasant to feel cool grass about their toes again, and not to be in a hurry. And then they climbed down to the gushing water. They drank a little, a clean, cold, sharp draught, and sat down on a mossy stone, watching the patches of sun on the grass and the shadows of the sailing clouds passing over the floor of the dingle. The murmur of the Ents went on. It seemed a very strange and remote place outside their world, and far from everything that had ever happened to them. A great longing came over them for the faces and voices of their companions, especially for Frodo and Sam, and for Strider. At last there came a pause in the Ent voices, and looking up they saw Treebeard coming towards them with another Ent at his side. Hum, hum. Here I am again, said Treebeard. Are you getting weary or feeling impatient? Hmm? Eh? Well, I am afraid that you must not get impatient yet. We have finished the first stage now. But I have still got to explain things again to those that live a long way off far from Isengard. And those that I could not get round to before the moot. And after that we shall have to decide what to do. However, deciding what to do does not take and so long as going over all the facts and events that they have to make up their minds about. Still, it is no use denying we shall be here a long time yet. A couple of days, very likely. So I have brought you a companion. He has an ent house nearby. Breggalad is his elvish name. He says he has already made up his mind and does not need to remain at the moot. Hmm. Mm, he is the nearest thing among us to a hasty end. You ought to get on together. Goodbye. Treebeard turned and left them. Breggalad stood for some time surveying the hobbits solemnly, and they looked at him, wondering when he would show any signs of hastiness. He was tall and seemed to be one of the younger Ents. He had smooth, shining skin on his arms and legs. His lips were ruddy and his hair was grey-green. He could bend and sway like a slender tree in the wind. At last he spoke, and his voice, though resonant, was higher and clearer than Treebeard's. Ah, hmm... My friends, <laughs> let us go for a walk, he said. I am <laughs> Breggalad, 
that is quick beam in your language, but it is only a nickname, of course. They have called me that ever since I said yes to an elder ant before he had finished his question. <laughs> also, I drink quickly and go out while some are still wetting their beards. Come with me. He reached down two shapely arms and gave a long-fingered hand to each of the hobbits. All that day they walked about in the woods with him, singing and laughing, for Quickbeam often laughed. He laughed if the sun came out from behind a cloud, he laughed if they came upon a stream or spring, then he stooped and splashed his feet and head with water. He laughed sometimes at some sound or whisper in the trees. Whenever he saw a rowan tree, he halted a while with his arms stretched out and sang and swayed as he sang. At nightfall he brought them to his end house, nothing more than a mossy stone set upon turves under a green bank. Rowan trees grew in a circle about it, and there was water, as in all end houses, a spring bubbling out from the bank. They talked for a while as darkness fell on the forest. Not far away, the voices of the Entmoot could be heard still going on, but now they seemed deeper and less leisurely, and every now and again one great voice would rise in a high and quickening music while all the others died away. But beside them, Breggalad spoke gently in their own tongue, almost whispering, and they learned that he belonged to Skinbark's people, and the country where they had lived had been ravaged. That seemed to the hobbits quite enough to explain his hastiness, at least in the matter of orcs. There were rowan trees in my home, said Bregalad softly and sadly. Rowan trees that took root when I was an enting many, many years ago in the quiet of the world. The oldest were planted by the Ents to try and please the Ent wives, but they looked at them and smiled, and said that they knew where whiter blossom and richer fruit were growing. Yet there are no trees of all that race, the people of the rose, that are so beautiful to me. And these trees grew and grew till the shadow of each was like a green hall, and their red berries in the autumn were a burden, and a beauty, and a wonder. Birds used to flock there. I like birds, even when they chatter, <laughs> and the rowan has enough and to spare. But the birds became unfriendly, and greedy, and tore at the trees, and threw the fruit down, and did not eat it. Then orcs came with axes, and cut down my trees. I came and called them by their long names, but they did not quiver, they did not hear, or answer. They lay dead. O oh, Orofane, Lassimista, Carnimiri, O oh, Rowan fair, Upon your hair, How white the blossom lay. O oh, Rowan mine, I saw you shine upon a summer's day. Your rind so bright, your leaf so light, your voice so cool and soft. Upon your head, how golden red, the crown you bore aloft. 
O Rowan dead, upon your head, your hair is dry and grey. Your crown is spilled, your voice is stilled, forever and a day. O Orofane, Lassimista, Canimirie. The hobbits fell asleep to the sound of the soft singing of Bregelad, that seemed to lament in many tongues the fall of trees that he had loved. The next day they spent also in his company, but they did not go far from his house. Most of the time they sat silent under the shelter of the bank, for the wind was colder and the clouds closer and greyer. There was little sunshine, and in the distance the voices of the Ents of the Moot still rose and fell, sometimes loud and strong, sometimes low and sad, sometimes quickening, sometimes slow and solemn as a dirge. A second night came, and still the Ents held conclave under hurrying clouds and fitful stars. The third day broke bleak and windy. At sunrise the Ents' voices rose to a great clamour and then died down again. As the morning wore on the wind fell and the air grew heavy with expectancy. The hobbits could see that Bregalad was now listening intently, although to them down in the dell of his Ent house the sound of the moot was faint. The afternoon came, and the sun, going west towards the mountains, sent out long yellow beams between the cracks and fissures of the clouds. Suddenly they were aware that everything was very quiet. The whole forest stood in listening silence. Of course, the Ent voices had stopped. What did that mean? Bregalad was standing up erect and tense, looking back northwards towards Durndingle. Then with a crash came a great ringing shout. The trees quivered and bent as if a gust had struck them. There was another pause, and then a marching music began like solemn drums, and above the rolling beats and booms there welled voices singing high and strong. We come, we come, with roll of drum, to runda, runda, runda rum. The Ents were coming. Ever nearer and louder rose their song. We come, we come, with horn and drum, to rune, 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 rum. Bregalad picked up the hobbits and strode from his house. Before long they saw the marching line approaching. The Ents were swinging along with great strides down the slope towards them. Treebeard was at their head and some fifty followers were behind him, two abreast, keeping step with their feet and beating time with their hands upon their flanks. As they drew near, the flash and flicker of their eyes could be seen. Hum! Hum! Here we come with a boom. Here we come at last, called Treebeard when he caught sight of Bregalad and the hobbits. Come, join the moot. We are off. We are off to... Eisengard! 
to Isengard, the Ents cried in many voices. To Isengard! To Isengard, the Isengard, be ringed and barred with doors of stone. The Isengard be strong and hard, as cold as stone and bare as bone. We go, we go, we go to war, to hew the stone and break the door for bowl and bow are burning now the furnace roars we go to war to land of gloom with tramp of doom with roll of drum we come we come to isengard with doom we come with doom we come with doom we come. So they sang as they marched southwards. Bregalad, his eyes shining, swung into the line beside Treebeard. The old Ent now took the hobbits back and set them on his shoulders again. And so they rode proudly at the head of the singing company, with beating hearts and heads held high. Though they had expected something to happen eventually, they were amazed at the change that had come over the Ents. It seemed now as sudden as the bursting of a flood that had long been held back by a dyke. The Ents made up their minds rather quickly, after all, didn't they? Pippin ventured to say after some time, when for a moment the singing paused and only the beating of hands and feet was heard. Quickly, said Treebeard. Mm, yes, indeed, quicker than I expected. Indeed, I have not seen them roused like this for many an age. We Ents do not like being roused, and we never are roused unless it is clear to us that our trees and our lives are in great danger. That has not happened in this forest since the wars of Sauron and the men of the sea. It is the orc work, the wanton hewing, Rarum, without even the bad excuse of feeding the fires that has so angered us, and the treachery of a neighbor who should have helped us. Wizards ought to know better. They do know better. There is no curse in Elvish, Entish, or the tongues of men bad enough for such treachery. Down with Saruman! Will you really break the doors of Isengard? asked Mary. Oh, um, well, we could, you know. You do not know, perhaps, how strong we are. Maybe you have heard of trolls. They are mighty strong, but trolls are only counterfeits made by the enemy in the great darkness in mockery of Ents, as orcs were of elves. We are stronger than trolls. We are made of the bones of the earth. We can split stone like the roots of trees, only quicker, far quicker if our minds are roused. 
if we are not hewn down or destroyed by fire or blast of sorcery, we could split Isengard into splinters and crack its walls into rubble. But Saruman will try to stop you, won't he? Hmm. Oh, yes, that is so. I have not forgotten it, indeed. I have thought long about it, but you see many of the Ents are younger than I am by many lives of trees. Ah. Uh. They are all roused now, and their mind is all on one thing. Breaking Isengard! But they will start thinking again before long. They will cool down a little when we take our evening drink. What a thirst we shall have. But let them march now and sing. We have a long way to go, and there is time ahead for thought. It is something to have started. Treebeard marched on, singing with the others for a while, but after a time his voice died to a murmur and fell silent again. Pippin could see that his old brow was wrinkled and knotted. At last he looked up, and Pippin could see a sad look in his eyes. Sad, but not unhappy. There was a light in them, as if the green flame had sunk deeper into the dark wells of his thought. Of course, it is likely enough, my friends he said slowly, likely enough that we are going to our doom. The last march of the ends. But if we stayed at home and did nothing, doom would find us anyway sooner or later. That thought has long been growing in our hearts, and that is why we are marching now. It was not a hasty resolve. Now, at least the last march of the Ents may be worth a song. Aye, he sighed. We may help the other peoples before we pass away. Still, I should have liked to see the songs come true about the Entwives. I should dearly have liked to see Fimrathil again. <sighs> but there, my friends, Songs like trees bear fruit only in their own time and their own way, and sometimes they are withered untimely. The Ents went striding on at a great pace. They had descended into a long fold of the land that fell away southward. Now they began to climb up and up onto the high western ridge. The woods fell away and they came to scattered groups of birch, and then to bare slopes where only a few gaunt pine trees grew. The sun sank behind the dark hill back in front. Grey dusk fell. Pippin looked behind. The number of the Ents had grown. Or what was happening? Where the dim, bare slopes that they had crossed should lie, he thought he saw groves of trees, but they were moving. Could it be that the trees of Fangorn were awake, and the forest was rising, marching over the hills to war? He rubbed his eyes, wondering if sleep and shadow 
had deceived him, but the great grey shapes moved steadily onward. There was a noise like wind in many branches. The Ents were drawing near the crest of the ridge now, and all song had ceased. Night fell, and there was silence. Nothing was to be heard save a faint quiver of the earth beneath the feet of the Ents, and a rustle, the shade of a whisper as of many drifting leaves. At last they stood upon the summit, and looked down into a dark pit, the great cleft at the end of the mountains. Nan Kurunir, the valley of Saruman. Night lies over Isengard, said Treebeard. 